of page 102. All great stories at the top. Uh, all great storytellers have in common the freedom with which they move up and down the rungs of their experiences on a, as on a ladder. You see, it's doing an amazing <laughs> A ladder extending downward to the interior of the earth and disappearing into the clouds is the image for a collective experience to which even the deepest shock of every individual experience, death, constitutes no impediment or barrier. Uh, this is like the sky. This is deep in the earth. section 11 where he says that um, the storyteller borrows their authority from death um, and then he says in other words it is a natural history to which the stories refer back right, and right, then, it's amazing yeah, I don't yeah, understand yeah. that how, in, in what way, what, how does he define natural history in what way does an authority change from death to the back um, well the, he gives an example of the body found in the mind in that story by Hegel. Um, and I, I guess what you can assume is that a lot of storytelling has to do with dramas and tragedies of that order, stories of catastrophe, let's say, if not there. Um, and on the other hand, that's like a symbol or an expression of something more general or generic, like this, this diagram is meant to uh, represent going up and down uh, the ladder from the inside of the earth to the sky <coughs> with great ears. Um, storytelling, as, in his eye, working grounded in this, this review of Lesson, <coughs> this 18, 1880s uh, Russian uh, uh, writer, um, storytelling is uh, to do with the world of human beings, but it's also to do with the world of human beings and the earth below and the sky above. And so he wants to grab every opportunity he can to make that point. But how does, how does, I mean, what, what connection does that have to death? That because you're borrowing your authority from death, um, then, yeah, because yeah, yeah. of that, you refer back to natural history. What's well, I guess it's where biology uh, triumphs. Um, in human, in the human world, in human affairs, uh, it's like opening the door to natural history, if you like. That's how I would uh, interpret it. Um, in those radio plays he wrote for kids, uh, catastrophe is, a, is also a, a, a catastrophe is a major theme. Uh, he has a, a, one of his is the earthquake in Lisbon in. 1784. 1753. 55. 55, thanks. And, uh, <laughs> um, um, the collapse of the bridge over the Firth of Forth. I get the year. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me. Um, and, and, and so I'll, maybe one of the things, uh, my friend Katie Stewart, teaches uh, anthropology at Austin, Texas, and is very, uh, spent years living in Appalachia in West Virginia, and her major interest is actually storytelling in, the, in, in West Virginia. I mean, it seems that most of the storytelling that people are involved with is about death and catastrophe, certainly catastrophe, 
Um, I'm writing a book called um, Beauty and the Beast, and uh, I, sometimes I get off on the wrong foot when people ask me what it's about, and I say, oh, it's about liposuction amongst young, poor Colombian women who are now under the age of 30, say, and have no money whatsoever. They work as maids, for example, and are uh, scraping together their, their uh, sense to go and uh, get a thinner body. Uh, and um, but it, that's really not what a, a Beauty and the Beast is, is about for me. It, it, it's about uh, the stories that people tell about other people, often through the radio or the television or from the next door neighbor, uh, about uh, uh, beautifying uh, technology, beautifying surgery that ends <coughs> disastrously. In other words, it's catastrophic. Uh, and, 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 I'm interested in that in a Bertanian way because I see the sort of energy in the story slowly ascending, for example, to be beautiful. That's why I'm interested in the fairy story. Except these are fairy stories that go wrong. These are fairy stories with a bad ending. So that if I drew the arc of the story, you know, somehow we go, uh, I'm not a room star, I'm going to sort of go uh, somehow up like that and get this catastrophic um, fulfillment of the abyss. Um, not all stories are like that, of course. Um, it's just, it's, and I, but I don't want to get into genres and subgenres and things like that. Uh, but I, I, had, uh, I had written about the devil, this point here, I had written about the devil once and thought about the role of the devil in fairy stories and, and stories in general and the way in which the devil you do a contract with the devil and you get rich and you get all these wonderful things, but then eventually, you know, you have to pay with the soul. And um, uh, I had thought about this story as, as doing this, as doing that, you know, in the social context. And uh, after a while I thought, what it's really, for me, fine, what I'm thinking, what I came most impressed, was most impressed by finally, was this up and down movement, this movement of extremes, no matter what the extremes were, the, the sort of sudden rupture from one velocity, from one direction to another. That's what started to interest me a great deal. It's, sort of, it's like the inside of the story rather than the outside of the story. It's hard to communicate that that's uh, was a big switch for me because see, if you're doing social analysis, and we all do it all the time, whether you know, we call it that or not, uh, you, you usually, your first instinct is to think, what is the function, what is the effect of this story or of this artwork or of this custom? Uh, why do they have this thing on their roof? Or, you know, why do they do it this way and, and we do it that way and, and, and so on? And you have like discussions, you know. Um, but that's what I would call like the outside of the, of the custom, the, uh, the, the external impact. And I'm sort of more interested now in going on to this inside. Um, and stories of catastrophe uh, seem to be extremely interesting, extremely interesting to me. But, um, yeah, um, but it's also interesting in, in the first section where it says um, that the First World War process began to become apparent, uh, which is not all that since then. Was it not noticeable at the end of the war that men returned from the battlefield grown silent, not richer, but poorer and from equal experiences? That like is a great quote. That's the, that's, you, that passage is quoted again and again, by the way. Okay. It, it's a very brilliant image. So in this sense, the catastrophe, it, 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 I mean, is it, is it because it, there's this difference between the, the sort of the strategic experience or, or, you know, I mean, there's this like, Overwhelming catastrophe from which new stories can emerge, or yeah. you know, technical you know, histories. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things to say about that. Uh, you know, one is that the First World War has seen has a it, huge symbolic importance in Europe. Um, this insanity, you know, of, of one set of people over here and one set of people over there uh, killing each other, and there's generals who don't know anything ordering these people to go and kill all these other people and so on and so forth. So this is the insanity, there's the quantities, the numbers, the, the horrors of trench, trench warfare, the uh, winter especially, uh, like entire generations wiped out and all that stuff. Um, and, um, the, and, and yet it's, it's also taken like a Titanic or something, as 
a symbol of a, a, a whole like shift in epochs or eras, right? Uh, and Pliny means so sort of like who would not be so sort of scared uh, or fascinated by technological warfare. Uh, this is the first sort of really high tech warfare, right? The, uh, industrial war. Um, uh, and what are the implications uh, for the industrial world thereafter? All those things are wrapped up in that. But the sort of uh, the nakedness of the human body alone yeah. under this sky, and he gives you the sense that something in all of that uh, uh, has put a stop to the Leskov storyteller. So it's up to you and me to sort of take which bit of that we want. Mm -hmm. Did you find that the um the, we move from the Erfahrung uh, type of experience to the lived moment of the eleventh, to the shock, the world of shock. And it's in 1418, you know, Breton and these guys, he's, what is he, an ambulance bearer, or he's working as a, as a paramedic, and, and Aragon is the same sort of thing, I think, at least, yeah, I think he's a medical student, and a lot of people come out of that First World War. Like, Time was propitious for one reason or another to refigure uh, what the sort of thing that was talking about last night, the way I figure it, you know, like the human eyeball has become a different eyeball. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we do cubism now, we don't, we don't paint uh, Renaissance perspective, I mean, it's taken up this sort of jump. And we're going to write different, you know, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, blah, blah, blah. Something, <coughs> a lot of things are happening at that moment. Did you find that the, um, the traumatic violence that was going on in Colombia when you were there, were, were those events entering into the storytelling tradition of the country? Or were they just references to, I mean, did, did they, did I, they I, enter? Yeah, I, would, I would say yes, very much. Yeah. Very, very much. <coughs> Uh, I don't know how other people react. You know, have, you, have, you, have any of you uh, people seen um, the film called Pinochet about the dictator Chile, played by Patricia Guzman? <coughs> I, I, uh, that film starts in the desert in northern Chile uh, with a group of women standing around watching archaeologists and forensic uh, scientists unearthing mass grave. Uh, and, uh, I know these things can be faked, but it's absolutely staggering to see these low middle class, middle class women, uh, working class women standing there, talking straight into the camera about what this event means. You know? And I don't know exactly if they're telling stories or acting as like uh, provocateurs, you know, but it's, they start telling a story about whoever it was close to them who could be in this, in this very was thinking, my God, the ability to think, to stand on your feet and go forth like that. And then they go, some of those women go to, go to Spain to talk with uh, that, uh, that famous judge, Balthazar Garzón, is that his name? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, same sort of thing. I'm drifting a bit from your question, I'm answering it indirectly, but I, I'm really quite staggered by the capacity of certain cultures or subcultures to just uh, lay it on. Um, yeah, so I see where your question is going. You say, why would that, uh, that First World War be uh, a, a repressive force uh, and in other parts of the world something similar? It could even be the opposite. And I have no response. So, um, on a different scale. No, but to the side? Yeah. We'll come back. Okay. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if um, uh, Benjamin treats the notion of loss in related to storytelling and um, the you know the, the the shock the you know catastrophe as a shock. So I was wondering if he treats the notion of loss as loss. You know, if he treats it in any of his texts. So in uh, relation to storytelling. What, what is there a significant relationship in fear or in fire between loss and shock? <coughs> loss and shock, and if uh, storytelling, well, yeah, then 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 storytelling would be linked to uh, loss, right? If if loss is linked to shock and shock is linked to storytelling, 
I would think that it sounds right to me. Uh, but in, in your question, or in your question is, um, if shock is so shocking, why can't there be stories about shock? Mm. Um, no answer. Um, one thing I was thinking about stories in general. You may as well stop the sentence right there. <laughs> uh, is, uh, <laughs> people love telling stories because there's something unexpected. Uh, even miraculous, right? That's <coughs> something really unusual happened to you on uh, going to work today. <laughs> or you know what happened to my next door neighbor, or, uh, and so on. So there's something that you wouldn't think could happen, happened, uh, which I don't know if, uh, how much that was picked up here. I mean, the stories of disaster and catastrophe and, lo and let's say loss in general, I guess. Uh, could be almost seen that way too, that it's so terrible, this thing that you're talking about or mentioning that it, it uh, partakes of the supernatural. Uh, um, uh, the story must have something, uh, well, I was going to say, following up on that, what, what do you make of the fact that Benjamin says, a story or a good story uh, has no intention of explaining itself. Uh, you know, when he gives this example of, uh, from Herodotus, like a three line story, uh, that the king is, is defeated and has to watch this victory march and watches his daughter being carted off and watches his son being carted off and then breaks down crying when he sees his servant. And then he says, well, why does he only cry when he sees the servant? And everybody goes, you know, through the ages, answers that differently. And the story just continues uh, without any um, attempt to uh, explain itself, explain the accounts of the um, I think this is very important. I think it's very, very interesting because I know myself, and, I imagine a lot of people in the room, you're always, how could you resist um, wanting the story to expand, exfoliate, and explain itself? And I'm not answering your question directly. Um, what do you think about a loss and shock? Why would that, how does that impact storytelling? How might it impact storytelling? I mean, I see uh, storytelling as uh, photojournalism. As what? Photojournalism. Photojournalism? In, That's in interesting. It's really interesting. In the sense of the witness or... And, and there, I can... This is how, for me, it's kind of connected to the notion of loss. Sorry, I'm saying it very, in a very simplistic mm -hmm. way. So. Um. What is it, the loss of like capturing the moment? Yeah, capturing the moment was lost. You know. maybe, uh, maybe like that, the capturing is about to be something. Yeah, it's a good
You're still too. wanted to put in trauma here. Um, interruption. Huh? An interruption. Mm -hmm. Rupture. <laughs> Being too affected by something to be able to be critical about it. Sorry? Being too affected by something to be critical about it. Overwhelmed, maybe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> It's like an um, more uh, psychic tissue. Uh, I often think of it that way too. I, I think this complete uh, change in time and space, particularly time, and that time can stand still. Like um, I've been in a car accident, and suddenly the car is like turns somersaulting, uh, and it's like you almost see time, is, time is infinite at that moment, mm -hmm. uh, or frozen. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated by that. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly with, with the time doing really funny stuff like that. You know, one thing I want to stand back uh, from the discussion of it. I mean, I, uh, I, I really got a shock when I... Huh. <laughs> <laughs> I was really surprised uh, when I was thinking about this thing on the, uh, the, 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 the assumptions that are being made in the story of, about experience. Because I uh, had assumed, and I'm meant to be teaching anthropology and everything and have a sense of history, that experience is experience, you know. And then suddenly when you come across this storyteller, you say, hey, it wasn't always like this. Get with the program. Times change. People change. The culture is going to change. Now, all that is sort of cliche is what I'm saying right now. But I thought there were certain basic sorts of things, like experience, you know, but to historicize it this way. I think it's very, very uh, powerful whether you agree with the terms or not. And maybe we could go into the, the, the I mentioned the, um, um, so this time uh, it becoming like infinite and nothing at the same time, and you know, you could go on and on and on trying to, try, trying to uh, talk about that. And, and I think each term that you could come up with is just another one or another two. Um, there's a book called The Railway Journey by Shibu Bush. Does anybody know? Uh, it's a really a 
what they used to call in Australia a ball terror of a rock. Um, uh, bull gang. Not to be confused. <laughs> uh, the railway journey. Uh, subtitle is something like the impact of railway accidents on time and space. Concepts of time and space. The impact of the railway on time and space. So here again you've got this historicizing time and space, basically. Right? Mm -hmm. Big piece of technology <coughs> comes in the picture, the railway. And while Wolfgang is going to sort of be toying with the idea, you know, maybe your basic concept of time and space are going to change as a result of this, this railway journey. It's a fun book. And in there he has two or three chapters on shock because he focuses in on railway accidents and what people say about railway accidents and how sitting in a railway carriage uh, is going to cause this spinal problem and this head problem and it's totally unnatural and you shouldn't travel on the railway. And uh, it's like this whole folklore of, of the body and of time and space is going to come to the surface and in particular trying to understand what's happening to people in the, in the, in the, in the railway accident, which might be one of the, the first industrial, what you might call industrial machine age accidents. Um, and uh, he has a concept, first of all he says, where does the word shock come from? I mean, etymology is a always fun. And it seems like a French word uh, which has to do with knights, K-N-I-G-H-T-S, mm -hmm. jousting on their horses, you know, those knights, you see them on the, the movies, and they have a big lance and a big, beautiful white horse or black horse or something, and they're all in their armor, and uh, they have these long lances, and Lady Genevieve is up there, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they go at each other, and the, uh, the impact of the, um, of the lance on the body and is called the, the, the chop or the shock. Another thing you might notice in Spanish, you know, the Chinese and many languages, the same word is used. Not because it's anything universal, it just it seems to me it's spread. I mean, um, my Colombian friends here may contradict me, but I, I think I, um, I, the, the later word, uh, the way shock is used in Spanish, and in more recently, and probably since you've been born, the word estrés. Uh, is an example of what I mean. So I, I think the word shock radiated out to all corners of the world uh, fairly, fairly recently, I don't know. Um, Shivel Bush's uh, point, as I remember it, or one of his basic ideas, is that uh, as organizations, a society, for example, gets more complex, develop more uh, complicated ways of dealing with uh, accidents and shock, uh, and what Freud, uh, in the Beyond the Pleasure Principle, uh, put forward was that uh, human beings, uh, their consciousness, uh, I keep pointing to the head, uh, wraps itself in more and more uh, mechanisms for fending off sharp, like the knight, if you like, the knight in armor, has more and more bigger armor to stop this. But if that um, if the shock is so strong that it can penetrate that armor, then the, the drop, the collapse, is colossal. So it's like the more prepared you are, the more defensive you are, in a way, the more horrible uh, the impact is going to be if it fails. And so Shivalbush thinks about, say, he doesn't use this, but say 9-11, or say the electricity blackout in uh, 2003, on the east coast of the US. He, you know, people tell you the more sophisticated the society, the more capable it is of, of defending itself, blah, blah, you know. But then you sort of think, well, what about the opposite? The more intricate, you know, the, the more intricate the society is organized, and let's not even talk about the place of these huge bureaucracies where everybody's dodging the bullet and no one's gonna, you know, and those fighter planes that never took off uh, in 9-11, where well, they're supposed to be on instant alert and can be up there, you know, 10,000 feet in 45 seconds, theoretically, or they didn't even get off the ground, right? Um, and so on. So that's, it, it's a, that paradox is very fascinating, and Freud, in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, has this model of an amoeba, you know, what's unicellular thing out, like a little jelly bean or something in a vat, and if it gets beaten around a lot and you blow on it, you <coughs> up the water and do all this stuff, the, the amoeba develops 
develops a thicker uh, cortex, a thicker uh, membrane. And that's what he wants you to think about consciousness in the modern age. And so he's sort of, his story he's going to tell you is that as, as the decades go by, as the centuries go by in Western Europe, so the human being has developed this uh, thicker cortex. He put, sometimes he calls it a callus, like a callus on the thumb. Someone who's using their hand a lot will develop a you know, thick layer of skin. And he says exactly the same, or she will push to his heart with him, really, and so does Benjamin, uh, that uh, if this callus is uh, if penetrated, then uh, that's what you call shock. Now, he had to grapple with shock because it became this word that surfaced uh, particularly strongly, like, uh, you know, just going along like this, I guess, from the nights of the Middle Ages, and just building along, people say shock now and again, I suppose. And then suddenly, in the First World War, it's like this huge issue. Just like women were getting hysteria uh, in, in coming to Freud uh, in Vienna, well to do with women, uh, were not so well to do with women, but Charcot uh, used to demonstrate you know, in the, in the South FDA hospital in Paris, and Freud went there as a advanced student, studied with Charcot, and so on. So there's a sort of, it seems there's Elaine Showalter has written about this, you know, hysteria for women, shock for men. The shock for men being associated particularly, of course, with war. So all these men come back from war, they, they, they come back, and there's shell shock, or shock. And the word shock is particularly uh, strange because in surgical terms it becomes, it means rapid blood loss from which most people die. And um, it has all these uh, physiological effects. The heart rate increases, the skin becomes cold, the, the thousands of different things as the body clamps down to try and conserve the little bit of blood that it's got, got left and the adrenal glands and certain hormones that um, uh, are pumped out to try and help the body. But usually you go past the point of no return where all these defenses which are meant to help, like this adrenaline thing, is finally what kills you, or something like that. So it's like, you know, the body can only defend itself to a certain point and then the, the same defenses turn out to be self-destructive. So it's this sort of paradox that is going on and this funny combination between the surgical shock that the surgeons talk about and the other sort of shock which we're talking about, which I don't think can just be called, um, this is like the psychological, and the other stuff is the surgical. Um, I think the psychological, which we, I think we're just touching the surface of here, particularly I can never do more, um, I think it's a folklore of shock. I think there's a, uh, it's, a, it's a folkloric category and fascinating, fascinating. And it, it seems to pull into itself all sorts of weird, weird sorts of things. And in you know, modern Western history, the psychological and surgical have got uh, conflated and, 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 and I guess I'm going to say confused. But anyway, this notion of uh, uh, shock rhythms uh, uh, as being part of everyday life has given this colossal uh, importance in, um, in Benjamin's storyteller and um, in the uh, work that, <coughs> a lot of work that he tried to describe the modern, modern condition. Um, there was a Canadian called um, uh, Sayle, S-E-Y-L-E, -E, who in the 40s or 50s uh, uh, started to talk about stress. And um, it's the weirdest thing that uh, the um, physiological and biological research on shock that came out of the First World War, or during the First World War, mm -hmm. was mainly an American physiologist at Harvard called Walter Cannon, C A W N O N, and he wrote a book called The Wisdom of the Body. And remember when I was talking about the autonomic nervous system, how the body regulates itself automatically, and I moved on from that to the nervous system as a, as a, 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 a strategy for writing and thinking. Uh, Cannon is the guy who sort of pulled these concepts together uh, when he talked about the autonomic nervous system. And he was sent to France to work on this surgical show. And he was the one who said, well, you know, the body is this uh, combinatory mechanism defending itself, 
all these chemicals and mechanisms are working together, powers and, and so forth. And very, very important with the adrenal glands, pouring out the epinephrine and adrenaline for these soldiers bleeding to death. But see, when we talk about shock, when I talk about shock, I'm talking about the guys who can't think anymore. Now they call it traumatic, what do they call it? You know, Post-traumatic stress yeah, disorder. Yeah. Well, they should have stayed with shock. And all those, all those guys who have been sent to those loony bins and stuff like that and said, I don't want to go to war, I think war's bad, I don't want to go back. And, you know, oh, you're a malingerer. That's a big problem then. Are you a malingerer or are you in shock, you know, trying to figure out and all that sort of stuff. But that sort of shock is so different to this sort of shock. That's, I'm sorry, when I talk about conflation between the front wall and the surgical, <coughs> this is really, really what I thought I had in mind. Um, that uh, there are different universes, and some, for some reason, because of the medicalization of society, they get, they get put together. Um, and Cannon had this um, notion of the, the importance of adrenaline, and that became big time. And then shock is the avant-garde uh, aesthetic, uh, if you like, principle. And then 30, 40 years later, this Canadian comes out with this notion of stress. Uh, which is like shock in slow motion, the way I see it. And guess what? It's all got to do with this cortisone stuff, which is the outside of the adrenal gland. The adrenal glands sit on like little caps, and they sit on top of the kidneys, and the medulla or the inside is pumping out adrenaline and epinephrine, <laughs> you know, flight or fright, that was uh, Cannon's phrase. And <laughs> it's so incredible, this... The outside of the adrenal gland, the cortex, hence mm -hmm. cortisone, um, Sally says, you know, this is what is like a principal player uh, in the body under stress, the mind under stress. And we all talk about stress and we're very familiar with, with being stressed and using that as a category. So we have now a folklore uh, equivalent to the equivalent to the different thing? Uh, shock, and it's called stress. So it's just a little uh, Make of it what you want, but if you want to talk about an aesthetic, or you want a, a, a term which will sum up the 20th century, I mean, I think you've got to, you can move from the shock world to the stress world, and it's really quite uncanny, the uh, biological correlates uh, of that, and so we could talk more about that, but um, in the time we have, um, I thought... Um, what do you guys know, talking, thinking about the thesis on the philosophy of history, um, what do you think about the aims of history? Um, I know it's a bit of a jump, but it's really going to take us back to where we were 10 minutes ago. This is one of the leading motifs in, in Benjamin. A lot of people who don't know about Benjamin, they all know about the aims of history. Uh, does anybody know who... who Okay, so what's the importance of uh, the angel of history?
Stretch? Yeah, it's called a, it's called a stretch. The, there's an incredible sadness, despair, pessimism here. Benjamin is um, arguing against the Social Democrats and the institutionalized communist parties. He's writing this in 1939, 1940. Stalin have signed a pact. Uh, not to address each other, and communists the world over cannot believe that uh, the beloved brother Russia, the Soviet Union, would pull some shit like this and uh, do a deal with, the, uh, with, the, with their enemies, the Nazis. And uh, John Gross Patrick in his trilogy, uh, USA, uh, talks about suicides and Greenwich Village, and a big, big deal, right? Huge. Uh, but this had been going on from the late 20s, early 30s in Germany, and behind it was uh, Bregman's critique, is his critique is a left-wing uh, communist, or uh, you know, an intellectual, he never threw a bomb or grabbed a gun or anything. Uh, his brother George was capable of that. Uh, but this anarchist, it, uh, this, this essay, this thesis in fossil history is a, is a mix to me of anarchism, Marxism, uh, Cruz, the Kabbalah, I'll stop it right there. <laughs> um, complicated enough. But there's that what is going on. And the notion of progress, these evolutionary theories, these Darwinian theories that uh, Soviet communism and institutionalized communism was the world over because the Soviet, you know, Moscow really did, uh, you know, you, I always thought it was like a, a USA uh, fantasy that Moscow was calling, pulling, you know, pulling the strings. It's absolutely true from what I read and from what I think now. Um, but you mean, this was a horrific uh, way of thinking about history. And the thing that's, uh, so he, uh, progress is sort of the enemy. Progress is a very bad thought. Progress is a silly thought. This evolutionary notion that there will come a time in the evolution of history when it will be correct for, to organize the revolution, and for example, Maybe in this country, armed struggle. Maybe in this country, parliamentary struggle. That's what Marx thought for England, for instance. Um, this, Benjamin is putting forward a completely different notion that the, the more with pro you get lulled by progress, it's a hoodwinked, it's a lie, and all he can see is that the angel is looking and seeing history is just this increasing pile of, 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 of destruction, this increasing pile of. of horrendous garbage. And you want to stand there, the bigger the pile is going to get. And the angel wants to go back to paradise, but in its way is this history, ever mounting history of, of destruction. And the wind is blowing from paradise so strong that these wings, these wings are all caught. They can't move anymore. And so, so... No, <laughs> Behind that, behind that is, um, behind that is, um, well, go back to time again. Um, what, 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 is, what sort of philosophy or concept or approach to time, following on from what I just said at the end of history? I have a whole series of Columbia. Whenever I get a, I don't know, a spare penny, which is not very often, or can become some, you know, successful politician, academic, uh, into it. Uh, I have a series I call The Angel of History. And so a really interesting person comes to town and invites someone, and I have this great clay pop up drawing. Uh, <laughs> and, we, and it's all got Angel of History on it in, in black, and the angel is red, and then you just put in the name of the, of the angel person. And I've been doing that since 93. And that happens sporadically, you know. Really. Well, that's my question. Uh, what is the notion of time that is now involved, that is now involved so centrally in this in this thesis? It's a, it's probably the key thing in the thesis. What, what he calls messianic time. Right. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. Um, well, my understanding, and I actually have a question which relates to this, because there's something about this essay that I've never understood. But my understanding of messianic time would be the sort of moment when time begins to contract and begins to end, or an end is somehow. Yeah. The end, the silence, the stop in which anything can happen. 
And maybe, maybe, maybe <laughs> the Messiah, i.e. the revolution may occur, sort of thing. Um, that makes it sound a bit too passive, like you just sit here and wait. And I don't think that's intended at all. Um, but this uh, question of stasis uh, and constellation so it's supposed to, I don't know quite how to draw this, but one could try, because one thing that really makes me crazy and sad is hearing people talk about time. And of course, I lose them after 30 seconds. It's, it's like time is such an abstraction. It's just really, really hard it's to know what they're talking about. It's such a precise measurement of time to say that. I lose them in 30 seconds. <laughs> 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 That's messianic time. <laughs>
crazy automatons was, uh, was a huge craze, and the craftsmen were amazing, although I've heard these things existed in the Middle Ages as well, uh, that you could wind up an automaton and it could play a violin and catch a ball and you know, do all these amazing things. But this is an automaton that could play chess and was like an early computer because it could actually and it could react to your actions. So it moves the uh, pawn there, you move your king there, and then it will move it, uh, its queen. It's, it's not just playing the violin, it's, it sort of seems to be a stage more sophisticated. And of course it was a Turkish, uh, a dressed in Turkish attire, smoking a hookah, uh, and uh, sitting in front of a big desk on which there's a chessboard. And you come up here and you start playing chess, you the human being. And this damn automaton beats you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out there's um, a little uh, a dwarf or somebody small. Who's also, it's not only a dwarf, but some incredible chess genius <laughs> can handle all this. So this thing goes around all the courts of Europe and the, you know, the big shows. It goes to London, to Paris, to Moscow. It, like, for about 40 or 50 years, it was a big, big deal. And all the stories are amazing. The one I remember best is like, it was some chess-playing champ, a uh, chess-playing genius who was an officer in the Polish cavalry, and both legs had been amputated. Uh, <laughs> so it could fit into the box, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is uh, how this, uh, uh, these pieces begin. Um, and you can, um, parse out the, the analogies, but it's a very dramatic and disturbing statement. Um, the, the puppet, that is the Turk, Turkish chess player, we will now call historical materialism, it wins every time. It can easily be a match for anyone if it enriches the services of theology, which today we know is risen and has to be kept out of sight. So try and you know, you've got two sets of terms here. You've got the, the object, and then you've got this argument. You've got the chess player, and then you've got historical materials and theology, which is like the dwarf, the Polish cavalryman who is legs chopped off uh, underneath, guiding it. It's very really chilling, disturbing, powerful thing. And I just thought it was very fascinating that there was actually this object in existence, and it charmed and amused and annoyed people for a long time trying to figure what was going on. The other thing that I draw to your attention is the um, thing I've talked about twice, which I find absolutely amazing, magical, and wonderful, and have some trouble with, uh, which is this notion that in this uh, new, this different concept of time, or this moment when the arrow, time is an arrow, um, lasts through its 30 second duration and becomes the jetzt site and forms this totally new combination with something in the past. And the only thing I can do here, and I don't think it's, it, it works up to a point, is to invoke truth, the involuntary memory. I really do think that's the problem that's happening here. And also this mimetic faculty, uh, nonsensus, correspondences, charges the universe in a different way. Um, and and it's, it winds the image surface only to disappear. Um, and we do know there's this concept that Fenerian uses a lot called the dialectical image. And his references to it are always complicated, impossible, mysterious, wonderful. Um, that's another factor which seems to be uh, fascinating here. In, in one, just one little point. I mean, Brian was interesting last night when that have such a more complex idea of an image than I have. You know, to me it's quite straightforward. An image is an image. Uh, but he he won't allow that. You know, he, he sees an image as having a certain density and multiplicity of levels and and, and 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 so forth. I just like to think of an image as a flat picture. <laughs> um, and that's how I interpret those uh, those statements. I remember reading somewhere where Benjamin is talking about working in an archive, or am I talking about working in an archive in Popayan? And uh, you, at a certain point, Benjamin talks about the stories that you get from an archive. And he says that it's actually the images in the stories that are the most powerful thing of all. 
to the history, then you got the story, and then you got the image. And it seems like the image trumps everything else. And when you pause some of the dialectical image, I think that's what's been gotten at, that these images are supposed to surface and then disappear. And I think the artist, the revolutionary, the Christian, capitalistic, <laughs> uh, anarchist, Marxist, uh, outlook is to uh, figure out how to uh, work such uh, occasions or work such images. So they're the points that I think are sort of fascinating. And uh, to what extent they work on my, um, in our writing and so forth.